introduction and trias. So welcome to my PRS talk. Uh, this is my sixth PRS talk. I'm a member of the lab since uh, April 2017. And today I'm going to talk with you about my BVM paper, which will be presented uh, this year at the BVM, which is yeah, deep out of focus with comb beam CT consistency constraints. So when we want to reconstruct uh, tomographic images from projection images, what we need is an exact information about the geometry. So we need to know exactly from which orientation and position the view was acquired. And we're going to see later, yeah, tomorrow, how to do this uh, by, by Tobias in, an, in another approach. Uh, but uh, when this geometry information is, 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 not, is not fulfilled because the patient has moved, then we get some artifacts, right? So we can see here that we have those, those three artifacts, and that's because the patient has moved. And then the information that we have acquired on our detector is getting smeared back to, to wrong locations. And what we can see is the bigger the patient movement, so the bigger the misalignment, the bigger uh, the, the artifacts here are. And this idea can be used to actually compensate for motion, and this is commonly known as uh, the autofocus concept where we devise an image quality metric. So this is a single number that kind of summarizes how well our image is looking like. And then we optimize for a single number and uh, parameter and find a geometry that actually does a well job on this image quality metric. This idea was first presented in the field of MR motion compensation and what they used is the histogram entropy. And the idea we, behind histogram entropy and total variation is pretty similar to what we do in iterative reconstruction. We assume that we have homogeneous objects. And if there is some motion in those homogeneous regions, they will be distorted by those, those motion blurs and those uh, double edges. And then the uh, gray values of the histogram will get more randomly because they're not those distinct points. And the same for total variation. We will get more gradients. And this will uh, either increase our entropy or increase our total variation. Um, those features are handcrafted, and our idea is now, instead of using those handcrafted features that basically tells us uh, how a motion-free reconstruction must look like, we learn an image quality metric that not only tells us how the motion-free state looks like, but also can kind of uh, handle different states of motion so that we can find the optimum from a motion-corrupted scan. So what we need for this is a base measure, so a way to actually express motion uh, and this is what we, and there we use the reprojection error. <coughs> so the reprojection error, this is, a, uh, this is a kind of distance measure between two projections, and it measures the reconstruction relevant deviation. So if we have a point here and we project it with two projection geometries, P1 and P2, then we get a distance on the detector, and this is basically the reconstruction relevant deviation because a, a movement along this line would not affect our reprojection error. So we then train a network to actually predict the reprojection error from a reconstructed image. So we can generate our training data ourselves. And the upper part is how we generate our training data. So we start with a stack of projections. Then we, uh, so this is a motion-free uh, motion scan. Then we uh, manually modulate, or yeah, by kind of yeah, we, we randomly modulate the geometry to have some motion artifacts. And from this motion artifact, or from this menu, or from this modulated trajectory, we actually can compute our <laughs> reprojection error. So we have then our motion trajectory, our reprojection error, then we can reconstruct it, and then we have a reconstruction where we know exactly how the reprojection error is. And this is what we do a lot of times. So we generate a lot of training data from a patient, and then we put this into our network, and the network tries to request the reprojection error out of this. <laughs> so how we do is, is we use a 33-layer res residual network uh, at the end of fully connected layer. Our input is a 512 by images. Uh, we use the root mean square error because we actually, so our, our labels are perfectly right because the reprojection error is perfectly right. We use 20 clinical comb beam CT acquisitions, and for each patient we modulate 450, 450 different uh, yeah, motion shapes. So this gives us about 7,000 reconstructions for training, 900 for validation, and approximately 450 for testing. 
<laughs> so <coughs> the next thing is how well does our network predict it? So the better we can predict this reprojection error, the better our method will work. And if the reprojection error can be predicted perfectly, our method would work in every case because, uh, yeah, so if we can get a reprojection error of zero, then we know that there is no motion in. So this is the motion shapes we, we have trained the network with. So we see that we are kind of uh, accumulating the whole area and our idea is that any motion that occurs is, can, can kind of be, yeah, kind of be constructed by, by those kind of base motions, yeah. And when we then look at uh, our regression results, then we see that we have a quite nice lines on the x-axis. We see the mean reprojection error of a reconstruction. And on the y-axis, we see how well our network has estimated this reprojection error. And we can see a nice trend. And this is a quite difficult task, which can be seen from those uh, five images. And those five images all correspond to a mean reprojection error of approximately, approximately 45 millimeters. And they actually look quite dif different. So it's not like it's very clear that one image ha must have this kind of reprojection error because uh, depending on where the motion comes from and the anatomy and where like contours of the head are, it has a different yeah, representation. But still our network does a quite good job. And now the more important thing is that we are kind of getting a good trend. So it's not important to actually tell exactly the reprojection error but in the course of optimizing this motion, we need to have a decreasing reprojection error so that a better geometry is assigned a better reprojection error. And in addition, we are going to constrain this with a cone beam consistency constraints, uh, which is commonly known as Cronshaw theorem. And the idea here is if we have a projection and we are yeah, projecting this onto the detector, and if we take the line integral here, we are kind of computing a plane integral, but uh, we're doing this in polar coordinates. And what we forgot is we forgot to weigh this with the radial distance here. So uh, what we kind of, or what we can do is we can, we can find some clever transformation of variables. So we need something which is dependent on R, which is the, this vector here. Then we can uh, substitute our coordinates. And then we see that the derivative in, in this normal direction to the plane must then be equal to the derivative of the of the plane integral. So what we need to do next is we need to find uh, two lines that correspond to the same plane integral. This is where AP polar geometry comes into play. And then we can actually define a consistency measure by starting with two projections, computing all line integrals on the detector, apply Granger's theorem, so take the derivative in the normal direction, so the row direction, and then we need AP polar geometry to sample the, those those lines that are actually AP polar lines, and then we get two curves which must match exactly. If they don't match, then something must have happened. So it might be beam hardening, uh, it might be scatter, it might be motion. Uh, in our case, we assume it is due to motion. And now you, or not, not now, but now I will tell you why, why this is a good match with our deep autofocus because there are some shortcomings of this Cruncher theorem, and uh, this is due to the orientation of AP polar lines when we acquire a circular trajectory. So when we do this, we will get mostly horizontal AP polar lines, and this will lead to some motions that are good detectable and some that are not good detectable. And we call those in-plane motions motions within the acquisition plane, and they got kind of integrated out, so we are not going to see nicely those in-plane motions, whereas we can see nicely out-plane motions. And our deep autofocus is working on axial slices, so it will predict very good those in-plane motions and might not predict so good those out-plane motions. So it is a kind of good match. And this leads us to our motion estimation and compensation framework, where we start with a comb beam CT acquisition, so we get a trajectory out there. We get some projection images. We compute the relevant data we need. So this is the filtered projections because we apply FDK, so Feldkamp David Kress reconstruction. The consistency lookup table, this is the radon derivative we've seen before. And then we compute the, the reprojection error with our neural network. And we compute the consistency. The, we weight those terms together. And then we optimize for those values in an iterative manner until we are converging so the trajectory doesn't change anymore. And then we get a motion estimate. And then our results look like this. So we have here at the top the ground truth. We have here our motion corrupted image. 
and uh, if we use our proposed method, then we can get rid of those artifacts. And then the top is what we, what we get if we use entropy. So this is one of those handcrafted features that were very successful in literature. And what we can see is that the entropy is kind of getting stuck somewhere. And this is uh, because entropy basically tells us how a nice image looks like, but it doesn't tell us how, how two bad images are related to each other. Uh, so we are kind of getting a higher entropy image out than the beginning, but that's not corresponding to the motion-free image. And this is a relatively big motion, so uh, this problem with those local minima is basically with big motion. So this is for in-plane motion. For out-plane motion, we get something similar. So our proposed method can compensate the motion, and entropy is, again, getting stuck in a local minima. And now in the next yeah, it's, it's working. Uh, so now we see how, how the method actually works. So we're having here the image, and we're computing the reprojection error from this, which is the blue line here. And uh, what we do here is we uh, actually take a, a motion that is bigger than that that we have learned. Uh, so this is the reason why we here, um, oh, sorry, I, I, got, I, I mixed it up. So the, the blue line is the real reprojection error, and the the purple line is, is the estimated. And uh, because we haven't trained with so big motion amplitudes, we're uh, underestimating the reprojection error because our network is just trained to predict something up to 60, up to, yeah, actually up to 40. Um, but still, the trend is captured very nicely. And uh, now this is a bit confusing because now we are not using absolute numbers but percent. And what we can see is that we are minimizing the entropy, but the minimization of our entropy has nothing to do with the minimization of the reprojection error. And this is a typical problem with entropy-based optimization. So concluding, uh, we can outperform handcrafted features for big motions. So I didn't show you the small motions. Actually, entropy performs quite well if we have a very small motion, so for like chitter compensation. Uh, and what we also see is that our network actually does not perform so good on very small motion because it's trained on basically motions and it's not learning to express how motion-free actually looks, or how a perfectly motion-free scan looks like. We can tailor it to other anatomical regions and we can ensure data integrity, which is quite important for a learning-based approach. So this concludes my talk and thank you for listening. Thank mm -hmm. you.